Technical based on capital edition. And then this Friday, we'll be discussing the surgical techniques for cystectomy and uh, for cystectomy and uh, other uh, urinary diversion techniques. So can you hold for a while? Chat box. Good evening, Joey. So this is the incidence of uh, bladder cancer in history. So as you can see, uh, that there has been a decline since it was documented. This is due to the, the population is getting young. This is due to age. So what are the types of bladder cancer? Usually your primary tumors, the most common is your urothelial carcinoma, and the non-urothelial ones such as squamous cell, then carcinoma. And for secondary tumors, melanoma, colon, or metastatic uh, from the colon, state lung, and the breast. So what are the risk factors? 50% are smokers, those with chronic cystitis, chronic UTI, those with uh, prolonged IFC insertion for, and also those with uh, schistosoma infection and also with those who with chronic bladder stone. So when history taking, it's very important to, to check uh, for uh, chemical exposure or hazardous exposure such as this and also those who's taking medications. So what are the usual clinical presentation? Usually, it's a microscopic or gross painless hematuria. Urinary frequency from irritation or reduced bladder capacity is also common. UTI and upper tract obstruction. So what are the workups? So workups usually is cystoscopy, an MRI or CT scan. Uh, then eventually, you'll do a QRBT, green cell cytology. You can do a CT or MR urography. A renal ultrasound uh, and CT with contrast, and you of course ureteroscopy for those ad with advanced stages. So this is an example of a cystoscopic finding of a bladder mass. So what? So based on our NCN guidelines, this was just updated this year. So initially, if there's a high suspicion for bladder cancer, you do a history and PE. Your office cystoscopy, and you could also do cytology and other imaging techniques. And then once you do that, uh, you do TURBT. And then as we go along, we'll, this lecture is divided into non-muscle invasive and muscle invasive, uh, the management of muscle and non-muscle invasive bladder cancer. So let's start with the non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, or the TA, T1, and the carcinoma in situ. So first, approximately 70% of non-muscle invasive at presentation, 70% uh, is TA, 20% is T1 and 10% will present with carcinoma in situ. So usually you check for hematuria and other irritative voiding symptoms. So the diagnostics usually uh, cystoscopy and upper tract imaging. And then eventually we'll discuss about TUR, TUR. Okay, so progression is dependent on lesion grade. So this is for non-muscle invasive because iba siya sa muscle invasive. So this is the... Uh, it may be classified as high or low, or low, low risk. So there's such thing as papillary urethral neoplasm of low malignant potential, essentially benign papillary tumors with early, early cellular arrangement. So this is the, uh, it's, as you can see in this table, this is lifted from Campbell. So papillary high-grade cancer uh, has a relative frequency and progression date of 15 to 40. And also at the bottom, if you can see, carcinoma in situ is also frequent with high progression rate for carcinoma in situ. So this is a representative image of uh, how to stage a uh, uh, bladder cancer. So CIS is a flat high-grade lesion confined to the same layer. And it's, this is the way I remember it. So easy to remember for me. For T1, it's the lamina propria. T2, the muscle, muscularis propria. And T4 is the extra vesical fat. And for, for those uh, outside of uh, the bladder. So this is another representation. So you would, uh, you would focus more, more on T4. So this is another representative image. So for the tumor biology, a progression behavior is primarily grade, primarily grade dependent. 
prognosis also correlates with tumor size, multiplicity, uh, papillary versus C cell configuration, lymphovascular invasion, and the status of the epithelium. So for this, the high grade, uh, for the for the low grade, usually 50 to 70 percent, and progresses by five percent. And the high grade T1 lesions, uh, the current state is 80 percent. Uh, progression of uh, 50 percent. So for low grade, usually it's the chromosome nine, and for high grade, it's the seven, nine, and twelve, which is also as associated with aggressive tumors. So what are the characteristics by stage? So for TA, usually low grade, recurrence is common, progression is rare. 2.9 to 18 for two TA grade to tumor are high grade with an average of 6.9. And of course, as I mentioned earlier, the CIS, uh, this is uh, regarded as a precursor for develop development of invasive uh, high-grade cancer. So the management would be di uh, different from the others, from high-grade and low-grade. It should be always treated as high-grade. For the CIS, uh, 40 to 83% with CIS will develop muscle invasion if left untreated. So among this, 20% uh, who are treated with cystectomy uh, those 20 percent, uh, when they do did suspect to me, they found out there was already a muscle invasion. So for CIS, the second most important uh, prognostic factor after uh, grade. Um, so next is T1. So usually papillary uh, and often uh, have a narrow stalk. A no nodular C cell appearance suggests deeper invasion and a significant potential for understanding in patients with high grade apparent non-invasive tumors, especially those to appear at stage one. <clears throat> so what do we do after uh, noticing a bladder mass? So there's endoscopic management. So we could do office visitoscopy to know the location, the number, and the morphology of the tumor. So you can also check in office visitoscopy if there is ureteral orifices uh, involved in the bladder, neck, and prostatic ureta. Always do urine cytology. So the upper tract imaging is also performed uh, to identify other sources of hematuria and that says the extra vesical uh, urothelium. So this is uh, TURBT. So the initial treatment for visible lesions performed to remove all visible tumors provides specimens for pathologic examination to accurately determine stage and grade. So while you're at it, usually uh, this patient will be under anesthesia. You can do a bimanual uh, examination under anesthesia before preparation and draping unless it is uh, clearly non small and non-invasive it is repeated after resection so uh, also a fixation on bimanual examination if it's fixed or persistent of a palpable mass after resection suggests a locally advanced stage already so we can also check for the abdominal girth or fullness after resection uh, sometimes, if you feel uh, the abdominal girt increasing, it's a suggestive, suggestive of uh, perforation. So this is another example, uh, another example of a cystoscopic finding. So as we continue, usually uh, irrigation with bladder filled only enough to visualize its content, minimizes the bladder wall movement and lessens thinning of the detrusor through over distension, which should reduce the risk of perforation. So resection is done in a piecemeal pattern, uh, delayed uh, transection of the sock until most tumor has been resected to maintain counter traction. For friable uh, low-grade tumors, it often can be removed without the use of erectical energy. Uh, the non-powered cutting, non cutting loop will break um, many of the low-grade tumors. However, for the higher-grade ones, a more solid tumor and the base of all tumors requires a cutting current. So this current can also be used as hemostasis. So lifting the tumor edge away from the distrusor lessens the chance of perforation. Repeated slow fulguration may complicate the ability of the pathologist to determine the grade or invasion status. So timing is also important. After all, the tumor has been resected, an additional pass of the cutting loop or a cold cup biopsy can be obtained, obtained to sent to pathology uh, separately to determine the presence of uh, muscle invasion. So there's a variability in the completeness of resection among surgeons. So it's more on surgeon experience and expertise. So there's such thing also thing as uh, the obturator reflex, which is uh, can be minimized uh, while using, if you're using a bipolar uh, 
electroresection, those patients with general anesthesia and, uh, and relaxants. Also, uh, I've never seen this, but it says in the book that you can do regional anesthesia to the obturator nerve. So the TRBT uh, for anterior wall and dome tumors, uh, minimal, should be minimal bladder filling with manual compression of the lower abdomen. The ureteral orifice, uh, pure cutting current causes minimal scarring also. Resection of the orifice can be done. However, the resection of intramural ureter re re risks uh, your patient to reflux the malignant cells. So for small tumors, you could resect using a cold cup biopsy especially with elderly women with thin walled bladders. For grossly muscle invasive, make sure to do a biopsy of the border and base to establish invasion. So what are the complications uh, of TRBT and bladder biopsy? So usually it's uncontrolled hematuria and clinical bladder perforation. So to avoid this, you just avoid over distension. You may use uh, anesthetic paralysis for the obturator reflex and stage removal of a large bulky tumors. So how would you know? So usually you identify if it's exp the perforation is extraperitoneal and intraperitoneal with a uh, contrast. So for extraperitoneal, usually it's easily treated with a prolonged uh, catheter. However, for the manage management of uh, intraperitoneal injury, uh, it varies. Sometimes you can manage it uh, conservatively, but most of the time it requires an open or a laparoscopic surgical repair. So after TRBT, the next uh, management is a repeat TRBT. So why did I put this here? So sometimes when you failed or sometimes if you're not, you're not able to complete TRBT, you may do repeat TRBT after a week. So indication for this is an excessive tumor, volume, anatomic uh, inaccessibility, medical instability, and the risk of perforation. If a high-grade tumor is identified, uh, residual tumors identified at least 40% of the time. And it also uh, it has been said to have better survival. The efficacy of BCGC in preventing tumor progression is also higher. So again, it's usually one week after their initial resection. So next is the role of additional biopsies. So a concurrent uh, consensus is not indicated in low-risk patients. Uh, in low-grade papillary tumors and negative cytology. So with regards to high-grade, there's no consensus. However, if you're planning to do a neobladder creation, uh, you should anticipate for a high-grade disease. So you can do a prostate biopsy. Another, another issue that some, we sometimes uh, encounter is uh, a bladder mass while, scheduled, while your patient is scheduled on TURP. So how do we do about, uh, go about this? So you could do a TURP and TURBT at the same time for a low-grade bladder tumor. However, if you're considering a high-grade tumor, you should go for the, for the bladder first uh, to avoid uh, tumor seeding and possible intravasation of tumor cells that likely to metastasize. Next is, is intravesical therapy. So this is also an option to reduce recurrence or delay progression of bladder cancer. So an immediate... Uh, intravesical installation of chemotherapy may be given within 24 hours after uh, TURBT to prevent tumor cell implantation and recurrence. So the most commonly used is mitomycin C, but you can also use other agents, also category one, such as gemcitabine. So the treatment uh, has contraindication. So it should not be given to any patient if there's extensive uh, TURBT or perforation. So consider for most uh, patients following initial TURBT. So it's initiated, uh, as I said, initiated within 24 hours. So treatment option, uh, I always said this here. So the tumor implantation immediately after resection is responsible for many early recurrences. So it says here, uh, mitomycin appears to be the most effective adjuvant uh, intravesic chemotherapeutic uh, agent. So it works uh, single dose with six hours that lessens recurrence rate, uh, but it may give, be given within 24 hours. It has not been shown to have adequate impact for recurrent multiple or high-grade tumors. So this is reserved for your low-grade tumors. So what does it do? It is an alkylate, alkylating agent that inhibits DNA synthesis 
it appears to be the most effective among uh, adjuvant intravesical chemotherapeutic agents. So what's next? Next is uh, immunotherapy or BC. So this is uh, given two to, week, two to four weeks after tumor resection, but there should be a timing to allow for the epitalization. Re so do your analysis immediately after installation to rule out UTR or significant bleeding. Uh, traumatic catheterization, uh, delay treatment for, se for several days to one week. Uh, retain solution for at least two, also retain solution for at least two weeks. So this is according to most of the readings, such as your NCCN. So although there's no uh, optimum schedule, there's a induction course in maintenance therapy, the SWOG maintenance. So this is a, a three-week installation at 3, 6, 12, uh, 18, 24, 30, and 36 weeks. So the response is usually six months. It's a good predictor of prognosis. Um, with the number of patients developing progressive disease among non numbers So uh, this is a superior for high-grade T1 or CIS, since CIS should also be treated as high-grade. So this is the only uh, uh, agent shown to delay or reduce uh, progression, kanina recurrence, this one sa BGC, progression naman. So also it's important to note that quinolones decreases the viability of BGC and should be avoided. So also, as I've said, uh, for high risk lang. Why? Because for low risk, uh, there's a, a risk for the side effects. So it should not be given since it's not needed. So, uh, so it's a high efficacy and side effects compared to intravesical chemotherapy. And it's also contraindicated uh, in the setting of a disrupted urothelium because of the risk of uh, intravasation of bacterial sepsis and death. So what if it progresses? So, so these are the contraindications it's in the book. So there's such thing as uh, uh, toxicity for for BGC, so you manage what uh, you have. So mostly the uh, you can due to the BGC, uh, you can administer isoniazid, rifampin, three hundred milligrams per day, and five and six hundred milligrams per day orally until the symptoms uh, reside. So if your immunotherapy is your interferon, it's expensive. I have never seen this. Never had an experience with this and it can be effective in patients whom uh, BGC has failed. So the response is 15 to 20 percent. So for the another uh, role is less cleared compared to the role is less cleared with efficacy with uh, BGC, but it's favored due to non existent infectious complications for BGC sepsis. So next, what are the others? So as I've said, uh, the doxorubicin, uh, tayotepa, gemcitamine, and other toxins may also be used for uh, intravesical chemotherapy. So re important points to remember for this medication, for doxorubicin, chemical cystitis, or reduced bladder capacity, tayotepa, uh, FDA approved for treatment of papillary bladder CA. However, the side effect is uh, hematopoietic uh, toxicity. And then for that, uh, also commonly given the gemcitabine and toxins, So for a refractory high-grade disease, so what does this mean? So, so after giving your, uh, your initial six weeks uh, treatment, so it's already BGC failure. So BGC refractory resistant relapsing. However, you may want to wait for six months before declaring them fail failure. Because some uh, there was a document that would say from 57%, if you wait to six months, it may improve to 80%. So three, three to six months after therapy is uh, okay to wait for your BG, BGC response. So for the management, so uh, another BGC, if the initial course was chemo, another B, uh, BGC should also be considered unless uh, it fails, other treatment options may vary. So you can uh, shift your regimen. So with all that, I, uh, just to summarize what I said, actually it's in the NCCN. So for T, TA, so after your initial TURBT, you may observe and also you may give uh, intravesical therapy such as uh, gemcitabine or mitomycin C. For high-grade TA, so 
for high grade, remember, uh, you do TURBT. If it's incomplete, you do TURBT again. And then after, after you may give a BGC, intravesical chemotherapy. In case of complete resection, there's also a role for observation, although it's not category, category one, it, it's preferred. For T1, in, uh, for high grade, you advise the RBT if there's an incomplete resection and you may give a BGC. So later, I'll discuss, also discuss the role of cystectomy, especially for carcinoma in situ. So the role, role of early cystectomy. So despite the local treatment, many cases of high grade uh, non-muscle invasive will progress to invasion and the risk of cancer. Up to 50% would presume non-muscle invasive high grade disease. So undergo cystectomy will actually be found to have muscle invasive uh, disease. So this is uh, traditionally performed as an indication for mus only on for muscle invasive bladder cancer. Because 15% of those will have 50% uh, metastasis, even though you did cystectomy. So if taken long, more than tw 12 weeks, it uh, is associated with uh, poorer survival. So, so I was looking when to do cystoscopy based on the guidelines. So, for the AUA guidelines, it says that for cystectomy, first option with patients with refractory high-grade disease after an initial course of intravesical treatment, you may do cystectomy. So high-grade uh, refractory, you may, if it, you may do cystectomy. So this may role pa din yung cystectomy kahit sa low and high-grade lang siya and non-muscle invasive. So pag tinanong, when do you do early cystectomy for uh, non-muscle invasive. So, yun, yun. So, the role of tumor markers P53 and RB for the prediction of tumor behavior and response to therapy remains under uh, debate. So, the good thing about cystectomy, you may, uh, the advantage of uh, partial cystectomy is that you may do accurate staging versus TURBT because it allows you to do uh, lymphadenectomy. So that's the advantage of a cystectomy, early cystectomy. So the, these are the indications for high-grade disease, positive lymphovascular invasion, CIS, diverticular lesions, because uh, it's difficult to do TRBT, Invo those involving the distal ureters and prostatic urethra, refractory to initial treatment, this is the AUA guideline, a large bulky tumor, and anatomically increased be removed in their entire endoscopic location, such as with urethral stricture, large bladder, and also for those patients who request definitive treatment. So how do you do surveillance and, uh, and prevention? So you do cystoscopy and cytology. Uh, three months, so 18 to, from 18 months to 14 months, then Q6 for two years annually. And then, so what happens if you detect something? You do, you go about with all the cycles. So what do you do? You do again TURBT, and you go back to the algorithm that I showed before. And then you go back here for a cystoscopic surveillance. So also it's important to note that nowadays, flexible cystoscopy has essentially replaced a rigid cystoscopy for surveillance in men uh, in North America. So the... Uh, it's uh, convenient to look for recurrence for blood cancer. So cytology, it is important to note. It has a high specificity. Uh, reading suggests, positive reading suggests uh, existence of malignancy. Some books will also tell you that if a positive urine cytology would, would uh, suggest a high-grade uh, disease. So the bladder irrigation and barbertage increases the cellularity available for evacuation. However, there are po false positive results, such as for mechanical trauma for your barbertage and also the contrast media. So for two more markers, uh, it's not advice. It's not proven uh, advantageous at this time. So extravesical uh, surveillance, it's still debatable when to do this, but uh, probably an upper, an, an imaging uh, would be prudent to do. Now, however, not uh, as extensive anymore as a uh, excretory urogra. An ultrasound or a CT scan may be done. 
excuse me. So next is a, a secondary tumor with the prostatic urethra for a high risk non model invasive. So 10 to 15% of patients in five years would present with this. And in 10 years, 20 to 40. So with low grade, you can do just a basic TUR for uh, suspicious low grade disease. However, if it's high grade, you have to do your uh, radical cystoprostatectomy and consider urethrectomy if tumor is near the surgical margin. So actually, it's, it's also advised to do when you're doing TURBT, it's also advised to do a prostate biopsy, especially if, obviously, if there may lesion, or just to document, especially if you're preparing for a, for like an orthotopic approach for your uh, bladder, uh, bladder diversion. So you need a prostate biopsy most of the time. So uh, I already uh, mentioned this. It's, this is the version of the book. So what are the preventive strategies also? So this is modifiable, the smoking cessation, increased fluid intake for the carcinogens to flush out, flush out a low fat diet. Uh, some would say vitamins, but it's not uh, proven through large trials. Now for the second part of my lecture is the muscle invasive bladder CA. So we're already done with the non-muscle invasive. So it's muscle invasive uh, bladder cancer. So this is the fifth highest uh, malignancies of all in the US. 20 to 30% with muscle invasive bladder CA at initial uh, presentation. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Despite aggressive uh, treatment, most will experience recurrence and die of their disease. So a modal modal therapeutic approach is often necessary to improve survival. So what's the national history? It's highly lethal if left untreated with a mortality within two years at the diagnosis in 85% of the cases. And bladder cancer death after appro appropriate local treatment, typically due to systemic disease and majority occur is within treatment. So this is due to the significant micrometastasis and the current inability to stage identify accurately before definitive local treatments warrant a multidisciplinary approach. So the histology, more than 90% are urethelial carcinomas. Previously, it was called transitional carcinoma. So for the squamous cell, 5% 5 5 in the Western world associated with chronic QTI. Uh, more common in parts of the Middle East and Africa to infections with uh, schistosomal parasite and also adenocarcinoma 2%. I've seen one patient uh, originated from either the urethelium or urethros and will add more common sites for, uh, for metasta metastasis such as the breast and colorectal, uh, the colorectum. So also there's our neuroendocrine variants and some rare, the rhabdomyosarcoma, leiomarcus sarcoma, and the primary lymphoma. So for urethelia, there's micropapillary, sarcomatoid, squamous, and the glandular differentiation. Most of these subtypes are aggressive. So how do you, <clears throat> how do you, what do you do? So you determine by uh, TUR, so you, you you monitor the depth of invasion, so you know if it's a muscle invasive. You do by manual exam. Um, you may do liver function tests, chest for chest X-rays for metastatic workup, and a quantus enhanced cross-sectional imaging of the abdomen and pelvis with upper tract imaging. So for TUR, this is the gold standard. Uh, complete resection of tumor is advisable and safe and feasible. However, as I mentioned earlier, you may do repeat your TUR again, a TUR BT after one week from the initial TUR BT. So the status of the bladder neck in women and prostatic urethra in men should also be carefully evaluated at the time of initial resection. So most of the time, uh, with regards to uh, the surgical management, so you need this for, again, as I said earlier, for the choice of urinary diversion at the time of uh, radical cystectomy. So by manual examination, so uh, this is more, more in detail. So you just place your uh, dominant hand on the suprapubic area 
and one or two fingers of the non-dominant hand uh, in the rectum or vagina. So this can be performed uh, under anesthesia. So what do you what do you find out? So uh, clinical stage is a TA for non T to A for non palpable. If you palpate something like an injuration, it's T to B for a mobile three dimensional mass movable. It's uh, T3 A or T4 A for uh, invading adjacent the invading the adjacent structure and T4 B if it's fixed. Okay. So across sectional uh, imaging is prudent to do. Uh, it is recommended in CCN when there's uh, muscle, muscle invasive suspected prior to TURP. So most of the time we receive this patient, they already have the imaging. So it's optimal to obtain cross-section imaging before TUR. Uh, it should not be delayed seven days post-procedure to minimize uh, inflammatory artifacts. So it's advised to, take, to do it before. So sometimes those with hydronephrosis, it also uh, <clears throat> would uh, warrant that the risk has also in, has increased for extravascular disease. MRI is actually considered more accurate than CT scan in detecting the stage. However, they're not particular with uh, lymph nodes, the MRI. So it's still CT, it's still the choice. So this is uh, the staging for uh, bladder cancer. So I already, I already discussed the staging, just read on uh, nodes and metastas metastasis. So what is the treatment for mass invasive bladder cancer? So for T2 to T4A, it's still radical cystectomy, given that it's possible, it, it can be done. It can be done. So it provides excellent local control, control, pelvic recurrence rate as low as 4% in patients with N0 disease. It has superior outcomes if given with new adjuvant chemotherapy from the time of initial diagnosis of muscle invasion to cystectomy impacts oncologic outcomes. Okay, so currently, uh, greater emphasis is placed on urinary and sexual quality of life following cystectomy. So for men, preservation of the neuromuscular band, bundles, some of or all, the, all, or all of the prostate and seminal vesicles, and also the prostatic prevention to do transurethral sampling of the prostatic urethra. So this is the third time I mentioned this. So... At this time, it is important to weigh the risk of organ pres uh, preservation in relation to that of cancer recurrence. So you don't compromise your uh, your surgery to spare to spare the to spare your sexual function or in some instance your continence. So for radical cystectomy for women, it is a decision to preserve uterus, ovaries, and vagina. So for urethral for uh, urethral carcinoma, it rarely involves gynecologic organ. So for this, uh, it's still an, you may do pelvic excentration or you may not. So most of but most of the time, due to that this five percent, you may do it. So for pelvic lymph node dissection, so the lymph node status for muscle invasive, uh, it's the most powerful surrogate for long term recurrence free and overall survival following radical cystectomy. So a meticulous decision for better local control, it's potential for cure, stability, morbidity. So the extent of lymph node dissection is independent predictor of survival and local recurrence. So the exact extent is controversial. So I'll just mention for the drainage, for the primary drainage, it's the internal iliacs, external, the obturator, and the sacrals. For the secondary, the common iliac, para-aortic, inter-aortic cable, and the para -cable. So what does it, your Campbell 12 edition tells you? So these are the boundaries for 12 edition. So hindi naman nagbago before. I'll just mention it. Uh, genofemoral nerves laterally, internal iliac artery medially, Cooper's ligament inferiorly, and the point to which uh, the ureter crosses the common iliac artery superiorly. So they also mentioned there the extended, you just involve the entire common iliac and the presacral uh, lymph node pocket. So that comprises your pelvic, extended pelvic lymph node dissection. 
So, an uh, adequate pelvic limb node dissection for uh, bladder cancer at uh, maximum includes those nodes that I mentioned uh, earlier, those primary and secondary. Primary and secondary drainage. So, the lymph node density refers to the percentage of positive nodes in relative to the total number of nodes. So, I'll mention this next Friday, kung ilang yung, what's the advisable uh, node status. If adenopathy is encountered at the time of cystectomy, a frozen section should be taken to confirm the metastasis. An extended lymph node dissection and a radical cystectomy should be completed with when it's feasible. However, cystectomy should not be performed when the lymph node metastasis are unresectable due to bulk and also if there's an evidence of a periureteral disease when the bladder is fixed at the pelvic sideball or when the tumor is invading the rectosigmoid colon. So you, you may abort your procedure and just do a frozen section for, for instances like that. So for the ureter, there's not a definitive recommendation for the precise length of the distal ureter that should be removed at the time of uh, surgery. And the ureteral, ureteral margin status has proven to be an independent predictor of upper tract rift currents following cystectomies. That's why some would advise uh, ureteroscopy prior to cystectomy. However, uh, the risk factors are bladder CIS. For your, this is the risk factor for ureteral involvement. A bladder CIS, a distal ureteral involvement, and a high-grade TA to T1 disease. So next, the prostatic urethral carcinoma and the management of the distal urethra. So the absolute risk of having urethral recurrence following cystectomy is four to six. So manage for the female urethra, T4 tumors involving the urethra and or vagina mandate complete urethrectomy. Actually, I'm gonna mention this next week, but for females usually, when they detected, it's usually the high-grade ones already. So more high-grade sila than uh, than the early course of the than the early course of the disease. So so usually they are at risk if the tumor there is for they have a high risk for tumor recurrence if the primary uh, location is at the bladder bladder neck and uh, vaginal neck and also the lymph nodes. So you may do frozen, ana frozen section analysis of the distal urethra. So next, what are the outcomes? So pathologic stage and nodal metastasis are the strongest predictor of recurrence and survival. So the presence of a non-organ confined disease or T2 is a strong, uh, pathologic T2 is a strong predictor of outcome and lymph node status. So this is the five year survival rate for your bladder uh, cancer. So other prognostic factors for radical cystectomy, so the molecular markers, surgical experience, and hospital volume, MI and age is also a factor. So with those said, so those, all of those increase the risk, risk of uh, recurrence, aside from a positive margin, of course. A positive margin and lymph node. So despite aggressive surgical treatment, Approximately 50% of cystectomy patients will ultimately die of this disease. Recurrence of disease uh, often occurs with the first two years following surgery and median recurrence, recurrence times of seven to 18 months. So uh, with that said, that's why they're uh, leaning towards this now, the new adjuvant chemotherapy for muscle invasive bladder CA. So it has a lot of advantages. So it actually has the potential to downstage bulky and locally advanced tumors, allowing for a higher likelihood of negative surgical margins and allows the clinician to assess individual's response to therapy. So often, more often than not, a systemic therapy is of, often uh, tolerated before surgery rather than after. Uh, it, and it, the patients may delay the chemotherapy administration because of uh, complications of surgery or debilitation. So those pre the present with micrometastasis will receive therapy uh, in a more timely fashion 
when their burden of disease is potentially low. So the disadvantage, the only disadvantage for this, if, if he doesn't not want to chemotherapy. And then the disadvantage of that is you delay the chemotherapy for, you delay the surgery prior to, because you gave a new adjuvant chemotherapy for those patients who doesn't respond. <clears throat> so what are your recommendations? So for T2, uh, it's also considered, it's all T2 to T4A, it's always considered to do a neoadjuvant neo chemotherapy, especially uh, cisplatin-based. Uh, it's uh, all, also for EAU, that's, they also have the same recommendation. So for adjuvant, uh, I've mentioned this uh, a few slides back. So patients at high risk uh, for failure for cystectomy, such as those three T3 and T4, and a node positive disease, this may be an option. Why? Uh, adjuvant chemotherapy has been used in this population to attempt to treat uh, micrometastatic disease and improve uh, survival. The rationale is to allow immediate local treatment with cystectomy and avoids any delay in treatment with chemotherapy-resistant tumors. Because I don't think there's an option to know if the patient will respond to, will respond to treatment. So um, uh, a major limitation of, uh, uh, yeah, that's what I said. Uh, the major limitation of adjuvant chemotherapy is that often difficult or impossible for patients to undergo systemic therapy. Uh, following cystectomy, secondary to surgical deconditioning, uh, deterioration of renal function, and perioperative complications. So for adjuvant, the evidence of adjuvant chem chemotherapy is lack. So most of the guidelines would suggest, still suggest a new adjuvant uh, uh, chemotherapy. So to summarize what I said from stage two to four, so for our NCCN guidelines, so if a cystectomy candidate should undergo a new adjuvant cisplatin base, uh, new adjuvant chem chemotherapy before undergoing cystectomy. You also, you may do cystectomy alone for those who are not eligible to receive cisplatin base and concurrent, uh, also concurrent radiotherapy, chemoradiotherapy may also be given. So for stage two, same. So you will assess the tumor. So T2 and zero. So first you may do systemic therapy, uh, concurrent uh, chemo radiotherapy preferred. So this one yung uh, not at yung uh, second arm, which is dun sa not uh, where cystectomy is not possible. So T3A same. You do neoadjuvant uh, cisplatin based chemotherapy and you do chemoradiotherapy for those who cannot receive uh, cystectomy. So, bladder uh, preservation, so radical cystectomy, a major operative procedure with a significant high risk, a uh, significant uh, risk for perioperative morbidity and mortality. So, this, ito yung mga sinasabi ko dito, these are the disadvantage. So this advantage of cystectomy. So that's why there's an option, also an option for bladder preservation, although it's uh, not totally advised. So what is a uh, bladder pre preservation? So these are uh, for patients who are medically unfit to undergo surgery or who refuse surgery. So what do you do? So you do a complete TUR resection, even if it's bladder, if, even if it's muscle invasive, you give chemo and radiation. Although there are contraindications such as hydronephrosis, obvious T3 on imaging, CIS, so remember for CIS, always cystectomy, multifocal tumors, and other incomplete macroscopic tumor resection. <clears throat> How about if you just do uh, TRBP? So there are limitation for, limitations for this. Uh, there's an occult extravesical disease noted in patients with T2. So it's not advice. However, for uh, negative restating TUR and there's with no hydronephrosis, tumor size of less than 3 cm, uh, this may be an option also, but not advice. 
So I'll go back to partial cystectomy. So partial cystectomy, what's the advantage versus, uh, versus TRBP? So again, as, as I mentioned earlier, the advantage of uh, cystectomy early or partial is you can perform uh, staging properly since you can do your lymph node dissection. So partial cystectomy need for more stringent selection criteria. So uh, for the whole solitary tumors amenable for wide resection with two CM margins and should be away, away from the urethral orifice. So tumor is in a location that allows for complete resection while maintaining adequate uh, functional bladder capacity. So this is also a treatment for uracal adenosinoma. Exclusion criteria is a positive CIS carcinoma in situ due to its in nature of uh, increase in progression. How about primary, primary chemotherapy? So this is also an option for low stage, uh, small solitary tumor. So uh, radiation monotherapy, so these are the guidelines. So administer in 1.5 uh, to 2.0 grade dose per fraction. So I have never, uh, never encountered a patient uh, who had uh, radiation before, but uh, it has also the, almost the same five years overall survival rates as 26 to 50% and a full rate of 30%. So overall, the survival rate is ranging from 19 to 40% for, uh, for radiation alone. Since, uh, since I said that, since we know from the back of our heads that 50% of them will not respond to any treatment. So, as, so for, we go now to the metastatic bladder cancers. So same, we use a cisplatin-based combination therapy for patients with urothelial carcinoma. So the options are uh, MVAC, uh, high-dense uh, high MVAC, gemcitabin, and cisplatin. Although uh, majority of patients with metastatic disease, 40 to 70 percent will initially respond to this. So actually, the five-year overall survival for metastatic bladder cancer is just five to 20 percent for metastatic disease. So uh, conditions limiting the use of the systemic uh, treatment is renal renal insufficiency, poor performance status, comorbidities, and frailty. So we should, uh, for the oncologists, usually here, so they're requiring an equal performance status of more than two and a creatinine clearance of 60. What if it's actually contraindicated due to your renal disease, disease? So you may give a carboplatin substitute. However, mas higher yung requirement nun. They need a Karnovsky of 80%. And... Uh, Yung metastatic uh, depends. Usually, sorry, yung visceral uh, lung liver bone metastasis lang yung pwede. For other advanced, uh, it's not uh, given. Carboplatin is not given. So this is the summary of uh, what I said before regarding uh, uh, stage four. So and metastatic disease, so M1A is included here. So you'd go for a systemic therapy or a concurrent uh, radiochemotherapy. So for M1, you go straight to, cis, uh, to systemic therapy. So uh, I think I lost one slide. So the only, according to an AUA guidelines, the only time you'll allow to go with an um, uh, straight to cystectomy and adjuvant chemotherapy is when you're undergoing clinical trial. That's uh, the part that's lacking on your NCCN. So you may do, you may do, you may do adjuvant and cyst cystectomy first, and or then adjuvant chemotherapy if your uh, patient is enrolled on a clinical trial. But with regards to cisplatin or carboplatin, it's always used as neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So uh, that's actually the end of my lecture, but I just want to mention this, the use of intestinal segments for urinary, urinary diversion. So uh, 
this Friday I, w I will dwell on uh, the operative techniques of cystoscopy, uh, cystectomy, uh, ileal conduits, or and other urinary diversion. So continuous continent uh, diversions and orthotopic diversions. So for the stomach, uh, usually the complication are hypokalemic metabolic alkalosis. It has lower uh, incidence of bacteria. For the ileum, it's almost the same as uh, the colon. So the problem is vitamin D. B12 deficiency and diarrhea. So stones are also a problem for these patients. So there's a table in uh, Campbell for the uh, electrolyte disturbances. So just memorize this. So do we have a question? So remember the last slide, favorite question to? Do we have any questions from Tom? Hi, sir. Tom, ginagawa pa rin ba yung mga post-op uh, mitomycin intravesical therapy? Sir, honestly, sir, ang experience ko sa mitomycin, I think two patients in one year, sir. Okay. But um, theoretically, do you know why it's being done? Why it's suggested? Uh, yes, sir. role yes, post-op? It's supposedly, uh, for a complete resection for low grade, it supposedly decreases the uh, recurrence rate. However, the problem with mitomycin C, noong 2018, na pull out lahat ng stock sa Philippines. But it's back in the market last year, sir. So last year, I think we've given patients uh, dalawa with mitomycin, sir. So but for the residents, the patalan nyo, it's more of yung it prevents recurrence, it decreases recurrence. Yeah, it does not deal with progression, it has no effect on progression. So what are your contraindications for doing that post-op? So the contraindications for giving an intravesical uh, chemotherapy is usually those with bleeding or with, uh, with excessive uh, resection. Also with uh, for BGC naman sa infection, sir. So it's contraindicated since uh, it will uh, be absorbed by the patient. What agent has an effect on progression? For progression, usually the BGC. And some would say interferon, sir. So it deals with progression and for high grade naman, sir. Counting correction lang. It, I've been hearing BGC. It's BCG. <laughs> Sorry, sir. Sorry for for the juniors, ano yung, anong complication? Anong complication pagka na-transect ang curator na during lymph node dissection? Isn't it that your obturator nerve is one of your markers? So what happens if you transect the nerve? Why did you remember post ng paresthesia, sir? More than paresthesia, I'm about to also Yung internal rotation. No, well, I don't know the exact name of the muscle, pero by groups kasi yan eh. So if you transect the obturator nerve during your lymph node dissection, I expect mo mangyayari yun. Yung... Yung adductor muscle, sir, na...
So, uh, what answer are you looking for? The innervations are usually the obturator muscles. However, if uh, injured, you may have sensory problems in your. Uh, in your middle thigh. So your sensation in the middle thigh may be... Middle thigh, correct. So from what I recall, it's the middle compartment. There are three groups of the thigh muscles. Eh. So the middle compartment are affected. Ngayon lang may hinanap ko, nothing fancy. I doubt na maalala ko rin yung mga pangalan ng muscles. Is there something new? Surveillance histoscopy. May pinago ba sila? Still the same three months for the first years. Still the same. But, sir, sir, more, you can always do an office histoscopy, sir. Then, an, uh, uh, office. Oh, yes, sir. Mas advisable po siya. Po. Although you cannot do PURP for those patients. But if, essentially, you'll still do an imaging for, for most of your follow up, sir. Okay. So, this, 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 yes, sir. Uh, did they mention how uh, gemcitabine is given if you don't have mitomycin C? Uh, sir, I haven't, I haven't read the gemcitabine, but from what I know from my previous reading, it's same then, sir. So, intravesical then, po. So, how do you give mitomycin? But I have to confirm, sir, because I haven't read recently regarding gemcitabine. But it's also category. It's preferred in category A also. So. Oh, actually, uh, it's the same. Uh, I'll share your slide. And uh, it's also given similar. And uh, ang induction niya is every two weeks. on weekly parent for six doses. So one to two hours clamp. Tapos, uh, yeah, same thing. And then for six doses, once a week. And then actually, ang, ad, ang disadvantage nito, may additional pa siya na maintenance. Ang difference na with mitomycin, six weeks lang siya eh. But this one has maintenance. So uh, it is a monthly dose for 10 doses starting six weeks after the end of induction. So additional lang. Uh, kasi... I had an experience recently, last uh, two months ago, may patient ako na actually nawala na may to C sa market. Recently lang. All drug companies I've asked. So, I was resorting to this. Apparently, yung price niya is very expensive. In UCPI, I think it's around uh, 26,000 <laughs> per dose. So, yun lang. Para meron lang kayong idea. Kasi yung mitomycin yata is I think 17,000. Tama ba? Estimate lang naman. Oh, sir. Nawala siya sa market. I think that was 2018, sir. Tapos or late last year yata bumalik. Oo, and then nawala ulit. Nagka-problem ah, sila sa importation. So that's why for those who are interested, no, uh, gemcitabine is in the market but it will be more expensive in the long run because you have the six weeks induction and then another 10 weeks as maintenance. But it's it's the same. Same side effects, same mga kanyang uh, uh, efficacy. Added knowledge. Boss Mike, pwede bang magtanong? Pwede. Uh, <laughs> um, tanong ko lang. No? Uh, would also want to share my experience. When you do intravesical chemotherapy, do you use a two-way or a three-way catheter? Uh, two-way, sir. Okay. No, because I, I remember way back 
uh, two-way din yung ginagamit ko. But I had a patient na pumunta sa akin kasi uh, after nung intravesical chemo, uh, I think nung nangyari, nung tinanggal yung catheter, he was not able to completely drain his bladder. So, nung umihi siya, can you imagine the chemotherapeutic agent na dumaan sa urethra? So, yung urethritis niya eh parang perpetual na. So, since then, I don't know, baka sina Dr. Len and lahat. What I do is, three-way na yung kinakabit ko and then after after draining the bladder, I run a liter of saline. Just to wash it. Para siguradong tanggal talaga. And then, remove the catheter. Because kawawang-kawawa yung pasyente na may urethritis dahil sa mitomycin. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. We used to make in, uh, we used to place our patient on a lateral and left and right lateral decubitus position. But based on our readings, it doesn't actually matter. So that's the new part on giving, the new information on giving my item my Because in the books, I've read that uh, the position is also a factor. But nowadays, you may just take, actually, sir, what we do is we take out the catheter and then we send the patient at the, at the washroom. I, I think it's uh, of no consequence kung your chemotherapeutic agent is uh, ano, high street. Pero if you're doing some cytobin siguro or yung mga cytotoxic na chemo, then you need to completely drain the bladder. Thank you, sir. High street is BGC, di ba? Yes. Actually, uh, <laughs> additional, hindi, dun sa pinakita kong study, no? ang style nila dito is here. Additional one hour of diuresis after draining the drug. Okay. So, unclap the catheter, allow the urine and the drug to drain. And then, after one hour of diuresis, remove the catheter. So, Ay, yun naman pala. Pwede dito. Oh, yun nga. Pwede rin ganyan. Or pwede rin Dayain si... mo na lang, sir. Mag-clysis ko doon. Or pwede rin. <laughs> oh, pwede rin. Or uh, gusto mo, ultrasound mo, para completely drain ba talaga siya. <laughs> Raming options. <laughs> Sir, last year I would like to... Yes, sir. Yung mga juniors na nagmamaytumaisin na ba? Hindi pa, sir. Kami ni Ryan. Yes, sir. Lang yung... Ay, yes, sir. Nakapagmaytumaisin na ako, sir. Ayun. Yung... So, below Ryan, at least malay, guide nyo muna sila since nawala nga sa market. May magsastart ulit. Eh, i-just guide them. Dr. Alpas, magkano yung SRP nung gem site na favor, sir? Compared sa maytumaisin. <laughs> Actually, yung sa UCPI, tinanong ko, nasa 26,000. Uh, that's for ano na, um, tawag dito yung dosage nila. Kasi ang dosage nun, ito yan. Again, ha, let me share the screen. So, ang isang vial kasi is 2 gram at 1 gram. Ang requirement is 2 grams. So, you need 2 vials, uh, 2 syringes. Yan. So, Ang isa kasi is, I think, 13,000 sa UCPI. Pero actual nun, secret. Hindi, <laughs> joke lang. Hindi, <laughs> ano yan. As, uh, tinanong ko something somewhere around 10 yata. So, if you go direct, it's around 10,000. More expensive pa rin siya than my two guys. Thank you, sir. So, sir, tatanong ko. When do you give your mitomycin? Do you give it pag may histopath result ka na, na non-muscle invasive? Sir, ideally no, sir. Uh, so when? The premise of giving mitomycin is for low grade. And in so the when? Uh, ideally, sir, within 24 hours. Pero kami, sir, hinihintay namin yung histopath. But so, kung may if, pera, you give it for, if you give it for 24 hours, within 24 hours, dati Sabi within four to six hours. Tapos lately, 24 hours, pwede pa daw. So what is the pros and cons of giving it within 24 hours versus waiting for the histopathic result, which would come out after five to seven days? 
as teacher, it lessens the the bioavailability. The actual actually, it's not twenty four hours. The actual uh, the best time to take for the mitomycin to take effect is less than six hours. Four to six but, nga before. Oh. Six so hours. Six what hours. would what would your regimen be if you give it within four to six hours? Or pag hinintay mo yung histopath, then binigay mo after a week? Or... Uh, the, the earlier, the better, sir. Actually, you give it right Ako after... Ako na lang sasagot. If you give it within four to six hours, pwedeng once mo lang binigay. Unlike if you give it after a week, di ba? You have to complete ilang doses yun. Ilang weekly regimen, ilang weekly... Four to six, sir. Oh, four diba? to six. But sure, so, I haven't yung single dose. Ayun eh, nga, sinasabi ko nga sa iyo. So, ako, so, siguro by this time, marami ka na rin nakitang bladder tumors. Pagkayod mo, at medyo napaisip ka, ay, makang mababaw lang to. It wouldn't hurt na magbigay ka. Kasi, mapa, mapapatip, makakatipid yung pasyente if ever. Yes, I don't know kung yun din ba yung ginagawa ng iba, pero gano'n ba katagal yung isopath result dyan? Uh, 7 to 10, sir. 7 to 10. And even in 4 to 6 hours, you won't have a uh, histopath result which would tell you depth of invasion, di ba? More so kung low or high grade. So, live a little, take a chance. <laughs> Actually, sir. I the more you... Sir, yung sinasabi ni Dr. Tiro na within 6 hours, yun din ang alam ko. But there's a reason why um, within 6 hours, there's a target in the bladder when you instill your mitomycin. So, yun yung question ko rin earlier. Aside from recurrence, why, what's the big deal with that single dose treatment post-op after you do your TURBT? One attempt. Sige nga. Why do you do that single dose within six hours? Usually at the RR. Sir, usually, according to my reading, ha, recently, sir, this is reading, so a single dose within six, six hours, that's the optimum time you lessen the recurrence rate, especially for a solitary, papillary, low-grade tumor. Given the fact that what Dr. Terrell said earlier, you may give it once. But if this, as your specimen say, it's low grade, you will still continue regardless of the result. The only time you will discontinue if you would change your management. Example, if it, you didn't get a muscle specimen or if it's a high grade. If it's a high grade, you may shift to your, to your uh, BCG. Yes, um, so correct. Kung, kung high grade nga siya. But yung target mo for a low grade tumor, non-invasive, even without the benefit of a histopath when you give your single dose you target the, uh, the cellular debris remember when you do your TURBT there's still some existing cellular debris of the cancer cells that's what you target plus you also target the seeding from your resection site so ideally you bring it down I don't know bilang percent yun given within six hours May hindi sinasabi rin ni Dr. Tiron kanina. Attach na yung excess. What is your... Uh, can you just answer the last question here regarding is it different for surveillance? It's different for uh, depending on your risk. So different for low risk, different for intermediate and uh, high risk. This is only in NCC. So the difference is uh, for year one for low, it's just 3 and 12. However, Pagdating mo ng year two to, to five, you just do it. Uh, year two to five, you just do it annually. However, those who would present with uh, high grade, uh, you do three, six, twelve, and every month, uh, every six months for year two, and then annually three, four, five. So to answer your question, it varies depending on the uh, risk. So if we don't uh, have any more questions, we'll do this Sir, um, yung sa field change, 
Yung assessment po ba nun, yun na yung nag-URS ka at nag-prostate biopsy ka? Or different? Uh, and what exactly do you look for? Uh, where are you getting at? The only reason why you do a, why you do a prostate biopsy is to check to properly state your patients, especially when you're planning on doing uh, when you're planning on doing uh, urinary diversion, especially for an orthotopic uh, orthotopic, because it wouldn't uh, orthotopic a uh, neobladder, because it wouldn't change your management. You probably still do cystectomy. So, kung ganon nakita mo positive, you, you do urethrectomy, you do additional urethrectomy, and then it would change your management, so you can you cannot do uh, orthotopic neo bladder anymore. But I get your question. Thanks for it. Also, we do your um, prostate uh, TUR. It would be best if you focus on the five and seven position because there's uh, an increased risk of uh, CIS over those positions. Yes. No way. Thank you, sir. So, if we don't have any more questions, so we'll see you again next Friday regarding it. will be more technical regarding the uh, management or surgical management of uh, bladder CA. Uh, sure. We'll take